Uh, we are very we are very lucky to have uh, uh, the Panuskas here this evening to uh, share some information about their operation. And with that, I would like to uh, start by um, uh, first having our uh, panel, uh, panelists or other uh, uh, members of our Sheep and Goat series team to introduce themselves. So if I could have uh, uh, Travis go ahead and, and introduce himself. Hello, I'm Dr. Travis Hoffman. Uh, I serve as the North Dakota State University and the University of Minnesota Extension Sheep and Goat Specialist. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Brenda? Brenda Miller. I am the local educator in Todd County, and my, my focus is livestock, dairy, beef, and sometimes goats. Great, thank you. Colleen? Colleen Carlson, University of Minnesota Extension in Carver and Scott counties. And my focus is ag production systems, so all things agriculture. Glad to have everyone with us tonight. Wayne, could you please introduce yourself? Sure, Wayne Martin, I'm with Extension. Um, my area is alternative livestock systems. So I tend to work with smaller scale producers, beginning farmers, and the new immigrant community. Great, thank you. And Emma, can you take it from here? Yes, thanks, Troy. Hello, everybody. I am Emma Severins. I'm a local extension educator in Nicollet and Sibley counties. And tonight we are very um, lucky to have joined us is Sherry and Rob Panuska. And um, they are the farm that we did, the commercial dairy goat operation that we did the virtual tour on. So um, I'm going to in, hand it over to Sherry and Rob to introduce themselves. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Rob. Hi, I'm Sherry. Glad that uh, you can join us and hopefully you find this informative and interesting and ask lots of questions. Okay. Um, Sherry and Rob uh, Panuska are located near New Richland, Minnesota. Um, their farm started as a small hobby farm in the 1970s, and they've been running their current dairy that they're at since 1991. Um, they raise Sonnens, La Manches, and Sables, and are currently have 128 milking does, young stock, and also herd sires. Their farm is registered with the American Dairy Goat Association and the milk that they produce is shipped to Saputo and in, in Lancaster, Wisconsin. And um, they're also, their dairy is DHIA tested and appraised. So now I will go into the video of the virtual tour of their farm. I would also like to mention before we get into the video that if you're having troubles with the audio, it may be a little bit quiet. Um, so maybe just turning up your volume all the way that it can go. Um, if you have questions, keep those questions. You can put them into our Q&A. We'll get to those afterwards. Um, there'll be a time session to ask Sherry and Rob questions um, for them to share their experience with you. And um, also there are closed captions at the bottom. So um, that's there for you to view as well. And if there's other viewing issues, you will be sent a link to the video after the webinar. So you'll be able to review this um, video on your own time as well. So if there's any issues such as that, um, with that, I think I will get started with the video. So let me get it to the beginning here. And okay. I'm Sherry Kanuska. I'm Rob. We've been uh, raising dairy goats together for the last 45 years. We've had the uh, dairy since uh, 
with just a couple of family milk goats back in the 1970s when homesteading was really popular. And then we got interested in breeding and showing the goats as a hobby. And we were soon producing you know, a large volume of milk and it just seemed to make sense to transition into a dairy to utilize that. We started with the Sonnens, which are the, uh, the white Swiss free goats. Um, tried a few others and then realized what was so good about the Sonnens. They're just you know, the top producers. They're kind of the whole state of the goat world. And they're all about business. I want my food, I'll come into the parlor, I'll get milk. My daughter wanted something different to show that wasn't competing with mom Sonny. She wanted Nubians, and we can compromise on Lamontas. <laughs> so I didn't quite feel up to the drama that Nubians bring into the situation. Um, what I found with the Lamontas, they're absolutely great with kids. They are so curious and so friendly. And on the commercial situation, they're the ones that will drive you a little bit crazy because they want to stop and play with the light switches on the way to and from the parlor and just see what they can get into. And then we've uh, more recently started the Sable Sonnen, which is just a colored offshoot of the Sonnen breed. So we're really excited about them. Um, just uh, something new and uh, same kind of working ability that the white girls have. So over the years, as uh, your operation has come together, um, what sort of uh, places have you utilized for resources uh, in addition to uh, how have you learned more about the production system and uh, what uh, what things uh, you've adopted in that process. I'm a lifetime member of the American Dairy Goat Association, and so I have attended some of their products conventions, which bring in a lot of good resources that uh, you can allow the University Extension to uh, share their knowledge of uh, what it takes to produce good quality milk. How critical is it that you feel uh, it's necessary to maintain registered stock in the process or do crossbeds work well for you in your operation or have you tried to maintain that pure um, breed composition for the most part? For us, half of our income is from breeding stock sales and so we need the registered animals of proof of pedigree that uh, to bring in sales. And then you also use DHIA? Yes, I do. Yep. Um, I feel the only way to breed a better goat is to have those records. Um, when I was first starting, you know, you had people that would hand milk and what they thought those does were milking. I think they were underestimating the amount of foam in the pail because those does never lived up to those expectations. So you really, yeah, need proof that that's what they are milking. And over a long period of time, um, kids are a lot of work in a dairy. So we have gone to extended lactations, milking some does for two or three years at a time, just to cut down the number of kids. And I feel that really adds to the does longevity as well. You're going to run into health usual uh, health issues. It's usually with that metabolic change from being a dry to a milking dough that you're going to have issues. Have you modified your uh, dry period rations uh, similar to how they modify dairy cow rations to minimize things like milk fevers and uh, um, other such metabolic uh, issues? We find that with goats, ketosis is more of an issue with the multiple fetuses than milk fever is ever going to be. So we do um, just grass hay on the very early dry period, trying to get these high producing does to quit milking. But then we do reintroduce the alfalfa so that they have a pretty high level of nutrition by the time they freshen which helps prevent ketosis. It also helps transition them directly into the milk and strength. In our parlor, we have one trough for feeding grain, so it's hard to gradually increase the dose. So by increasing while they're still in that dry phase, 
we have fewer issues. Hmm. From the feed standpoint, that's probably been the biggest struggle you know, of, of trying to raise good quality stock and have high production. In, several, in the last several years, it's been extremely challenging to find high quality alfalfa hay. We, we feed dry hay, uh, we feed big square bales, and we really don't want anything less than a relative feed value of less than 175 and less than 20% proof. And uh, we've actually ended up sourcing most of our hay the last few years out of South Dakota. It's just been very, very difficult with the weather to get good quality hay put up in our area. Um, but we've been fortunate to, to find good hay and been able to keep that production. And, and any dairyman, whether they're cattle or goats, will tell you that that is key to you know, good production and good quality forage. Um, you don't find very many goat dairies, if any, that I've heard of that are actually feeding on silage type rations. And that has to do more than, than anything with the listeriosis issues with spoiled feed because goats are much more sensitive to that than cattle are. So the dry hay does work. It is more labor intensive. There, there's no question about that. And that's, that's always a factor to consider. Yeah, we do uh, we do also feed uh, some grass hay. I have it our own alpha every day, twice a day. Um, I think that's really helped with the whole butterfat thing and kind of uh, keeping that rumen uh, working properly. Uh, in addition, we, we also feed a trace mineralized uh, salt and vitamin A, D, D, and buffer, uh, putting the carbon in free choice all the time. Uh, I think that's made a big difference. It's very interesting to see as, as conditions change, whether it's in production or weather or feed, how all of a sudden the mineral will just go, or the buffer will just go. I mean, it, 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 Kind of unique in how that goes to happen. The animals are adjusting their own, you know, intake to those types of things. So that your mineral that you provide is pre-mixed in its entirety. So there's no buffet sort of option. No, no buffet. We uh, buy a vitamin pack and a trace mineral pack separately, and then we mix it with plain white salt. Um, they found that those vitamins can degrade if they're mixed too far in advance. So we have uh, yeah, a separate pack. I've been very happy with the results there. We have extremely hard water with a lot of iron in it, so we have had mineral issues over the years, particularly in our spring and yearlings where we get some crooked legs or they don't want to take up the minerals that they need. Um, seems like the more alfalfa we fed, trying to keep the condition and growth on them, then that would tie up the molybdenum. The mineral pack we have found is uh, manufactured by Premier down in Washington, Iowa, and, and they actually specifically put that together for goats and salt. So uh, it's a kind of custom mineral pack that goes into the salt. Sherry mentioned the water situation, and like any livestock, that is absolutely critical. Uh, we have all automatic watering in the, in the larger pens. Um, we've found extremely good success with the Nelson waters out of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Very trouble free. They have a removable bowl, clean them really easy, dry them, bowl it, and get a little rusty. And, you know, that, that's just good practice to be able to you have to have good quality water for the fresh water in the animals. As far as the barn goes, if uh, you want to kind of pan around and look at that, this is actually a wick building. Um, it's what they call their solar truss, which allows that front light to come in. And as you can see today, it's, it's not quite as sunny, but at this time of year right now, that sun is about halfway across these pens, which are 32 feet deep. Okay, so it's interesting that as the sun rises during the summer, it will actually move completely out of the pens by the uh, by the, the, the June 20th date around that, that summer equinox. 
And then, of course, by December, that sun is actually all the way across the other side of the barn to the field. And it's, it's amazing how that keeps this barn nice. Um, it's fully curtained on both the south and the north. And we those are motorized curtains, so we can adjust those based on the, the conditions we have during the day. They're not automatic. We do it manually. But the south curtain is actually a split curtain, where the upper uh, quarter of that can be opened separately to allow for small amount of ventilation coming in, which is very beneficial in the middle of winter. When that sun beats down in here, it actually can warm this barn up significantly. And so having that to be able to open a little bit uh, really helps. The uh, soffits are all vented, so that also lets air in. In the summertime, when the weather's conducive to it, all the doors are open, all the curtains are open, and it's basically a free flow airflow. Uh, there is no power ventilation in this barn whatsoever. Um, all that does is create cost and add headaches, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> uh, the lighting, interestingly enough, um, is all LED. And those are, from our electrician, those are used exclusively almost in hog barns completely and very readily available and really quite inexpensive for what they are. And uh, there's enough lights in here and they're on a timer that we can adjust so we can extend daylight hours or whatever during the winter season for the winter production. Uh, but it's, it's almost daylight in here during the, during the darkness of the morning, that light. What, uh, what length of light do you typically utilize uh, in the winter time? So yeah, this bar now, this is our fourth season in it, and uh, so fairly new. Um, we, we do have outside feeder access with a hydraulic door, so we can open that to get feeder, you know, feed to the animals. Uh, concrete feeders, fence line feeder basically, they're half bunks. Um, that's one of the, probably one of the struggles in the goat industry is there isn't a lot of go-to places for equipment that's specifically designed for goats. So, um, you know, you end up somewhat compromising with some of that. And uh, I'm very fortunate that our son is a welder and he's got a tremendous ability to uh, put things together and make things work right. And, and I'm quite handy myself. And we, most of our feeders and everything here, we built ourselves. And our Including fence, your gating? Gating and fencing nice. is all built in place. Uh, and so uh, pretty custom from that standpoint. The gating is very, very nice. I really, uh, it was one of the first things that I appreciated. That you have, is that a typical J-bunk or did you pour that in place? That's a standard Weiser J-bunk, they call their cat bunk. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's a little bit small, too deep. Oh, too they deep. They can't quite reach all the way to the end as yearlings. When they get to be mature, they can. Okay. We put a concrete step on the inside so it gets them up a little more to be able to reach in there. But uh, yeah, they do just fine with it. And that easy. step is only about two inches? About three and a half. Four inches, inches actually. Yep. Okay. About four inches. Um, the, uh, very, very easy to clean and maintain. Um, and uh, so one, one thing about one thing about goats is uh, if, if there's a will, there's a way for them to get in trouble. Uh, whether it's trying to crawl through fencing or they will actually work in teams and can get these gates open if they're on both sides. Believe it or not. <laughs> but that's the nature of goats. So uh, we correct that with a, a stainless steel clamp on those that have goats on both sides. From the standpoint of animal housing, the areas that we have, each pen is 30 by 32, and that provides 40 square foot feet per head in a 24 head uh, pen, which is what we have in our parlor for milking. So um, again, they seem very comfortable in here. This, they don't have outside access, so this is where they stay all the time. Um, in our outside areas, we don't have that much indoor square footage, but they also have outside run available as well. So um, that would be the main difference there. But 
if you want to zoom in on those mineral feeders over here, you'll notice that's just a standard uh, double mineral feeder that's available at many uh, uh, farm type stores. But we have built and put a protector around that of, of two by six because goats are notorious for wanting to rub on things and scratch and they would literally break them right off the wall within hours of them being up. So um, that frame provides a protection for them so that they don't, uh, they, they don't destroy that. So. And then if we wanted to walk over and take a close look at those watering bowls, again, they're a Nelson waterer. Uh, very, very simple, very easy to maintain. To clean them, you simply remove the ring on the top, access the bowl, latch it down. You can remove the bowl and dump it, put it back on, and all set to go. And believe it or not, they uh, haven't found a way to wreck these yet. They're, uh, they still uh, maintain their integrity and uh, they will rub on them and scratch their heads, but, but they're a very a good. They're heated. Um, they have a, a, a large piece of conduit or, or tile actually coming up from the deep uh, seven foot depth that provides ground heat as well as the small element in the top. Uh, for heating and keeping the bowl warm in the winter. And they do, uh, they do work extremely well, indoors especially. We've never had any issues with them freezing. Outside, when we get high, high winds and 20 below zero, we will get a little ice ring on top that we have to clear, but otherwise they work very, very well. So, yeah, the feeder uh, is, again, these are a, a wiser calf bunk, actually, concrete eight foot sections. Um, we've added a four inch concrete step in front of them just so the animals have a little bit better ability to reach the back of that feeder because again they're built for calves not necessarily goats. Uh, the mature does don't have any trouble reaching the back but the yearlings uh, struggle a little bit just until they get larger but they're extremely easy to clean um, and they hold uh, adequate, adequate feed with no problem at all. And we actually have a hydraulic cover on that feeder since it is on the outside of the building. And that will be open during the summer most days when it's nice, closed up in the winter, obviously, but opens every time we feed into it. So, And if a person was going to have automated feeding through some type of a TMR mixer, uh, you could simply drive along that feeder and put that feed right in the, in the bunk. But, as mentioned earlier, we do feed everything as dry hay uh, out of the back of a uh, uh, utility vehicle. So, and in most cases, do they move pretty freely because you've got uh, uh, grain on the other end where they come in and jump right up there, and they say everything is perfect. Uh, green is a huge incentive to get them in. It works great for the Sonnens for the most part. Labanchas like to take detours just because they're curious and want to check things out. But yeah, it works pretty well. And I actually keep a spray bottle of water. Goats hate to get wet, so I could kind of move them along with a little squirt of water here and there and keep them moving. We don't have a holding pen. Each pen is 24, which is what the parlor holds. So it's all in and all out. I kind of feel holding pens are a waste of an animal's time. They usually don't have access to feed and water. And kind of like children in the back seat of the car on a long trip, they have nothing to do but pick on each other in that situation. So all in, all out works well for us. The gates do open to block off the aisle so they can't go past that point as they're returning, and that helps immensely. Have you had troubles with your curtains where they actually have found ways to chew on them, or uh, I see that it is very well blocked. Uh, um, I'm sure that if they get a chance, they uh, don't mind. Uh... Well, it's the, the beauty of the curtains are that they don't have access to them, except when they're in the aisle running forward and back. Doesn't give them a lot of time to get in trouble, but there's really nothing they can grab a hold of and grab. 
Otherwise, yes, they probably would um, be a problem. But the other side on the north side is high enough where they can't really reach it, and uh, we haven't had any issues with that at all. So. That was all part of our original design is trying to figure out just you know, how high it had to be so that they didn't have access to it. We have uh, these two pens that are close to the milking parlor. Um, we use them for either maternity pens or special need pens. If we have a doe that uh, has a little trouble getting around for some reason or needs to be separated out from the group, it's nice to have these pens that are indeed close to the parlor. So how many would you like to bring out of season? 24 um, for sure, one entire group or, you know, up to two groups, just trying to spread out the workload. And winter milk price is better than summer milk price. So the more does we have milking at that time as well would be beneficial. Have you had much success of out of season breeding up to this point? Uh, we've The first year we used lights, we had very good success and we haven't been able to duplicate that. Uh -huh. I don't know if that's our timing on it or, or why exactly that is. Uh, we have had some success using sheep seeders to bring some does in out of season. And occasionally we'll have others that are grouped with them that will come in at the same time or shortly after. Here uh, you'll still use natural service then on those that you use the cedars on, or will you use some AI on that? We will use live cover. Um, I just feel that we don't get as good a conception using AI. We don't get as good of success with cedars to combine the two. I'm a little concerned that, you know, it would bring our level down too low to be worthwhile. So with the cedars, do you also utilize any... Um, uh, Lutalase or other products? Lutalase and, and PG-600 if we are using them to get out of season. So this is, their this is the goat's travel. entry door. <laughs> so was this a converted parlor or was it a... Um, trying to think how the original layout, they had stanchions on this side of the barn and I think we had like um, a dirt floor, so like a calving pan and some other in this area. When we first moved here, we just moved. all our goats fit in these two pens when we first moved here. <laughs> just to show you what a, a small hobby can turn into uh, in a big hurry. But, uh, the parlor was actually one of those projects we did all ourselves except for the cement work and we did that in the middle of winter that year and uh, that worked out worked out quite well uh, we put floor heat in the parlor which is absolutely the best thing a person could ever do um, basically just use a, a standard gas powered water heater to, to heat that. that really when your feet are warm the rest of you is warm and that's the main thing about that we do have two ventilation fans in there, and those, those are both variable speed. So again, during those times when transition is, uh, we can adjust that airflow based on what's going on. In the summer, we can open the windows, fans are on, but 24 doors in there still gets warm, but um, it, it does seem to work out okay. Uh, probably the most uh, recent upgrade in that part that we made was a few years ago. We were able to purchase in a uh, the new GEA milking uh, claws from uh, originally had new pulse system. And these are the electronic pulsators, and, and uh, they, I guess, Sherry, you want to comment on those, but they're much easier to operate. Yeah, this is the Capra Twin from GEA uh, system, and with the electronic pulsation, it's a lot faster, more consistent pulsation than what we were getting with the new pulse. Uh, we'd originally went with the new pulse. We liked the idea of fewer hoses to manage, but the slowness of milking those does out was harder on teed ends, and nobody wants to spend more time milking than they absolutely have to. 
So just to reiterate, this barn was originally a uh, traditional Thai style dairy barn, which Correct. you have in essence converted over into a parlor and ultimately just travel lanes for the, uh, the does to yes. make it back and forth from their pens. Uh, um, stainless steel? Yes. Uh, tubes from a uh, dairy? Uh, yeah. Okay, that was, that's um, what I thought. That was a, um, I don't even know, what is it? an Amish farmer built that stand when we bought it from a dairy in Wisconsin that went out of business. Ah, okay. That's actually interesting now. It's a clean in place uh, wash unit on the uh, pipeline. Our stanchions we close individually, but the entire side can be released at one time. Designed for short people. People that are taller probably would want the platform higher yeah, yeah. because you really, if you don't have to bend over by the end of the day, it really makes a difference in how much stress you're putting on your back and knees. For every parlor, you need hoof trimmers, you need a thermometer. Monitor those hooves. Uh, you get a little dough that's milking a little bit slower out. You've got those few minutes. Trim a few hooves. Take advantage of that time and just not try to wait and do an entire group at one time. One, uh, one big advantage, I would say, of the going commercial in a, in a goat dairy, if you're going to stay within that maybe under 200 head animal line, is much of the equipment that you would, would be able to purchase, with the exception of the unique specialty goat claws, are going to be leftovers and outdated equipment that um, you know cow dairies no longer use because of their physical size. Um, we're using a two inch pipeline and inch and a half wash line. Um, you know everything in the big dairies now is a lot bigger than that so this type of material is read pretty readily available. Um, again one of the challenges that we have found is the the lack of ability to get service on a lot of this dairy equipment in our particular area. Um, I don't know the statistics completely, but I think there's only about three or four dairies left in our county here, two of which are dairy goats. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, um, you know, you don't find readily available service techs and, and people unless you're up in central Minnesota, in Stearns County, or you get over on the east side, east of Rochester. Um, so not that they won't come down here and service or come over, but you know, you pay from the time they leave the, the shop. And uh, we're very fortunate that I'm able to do a lot of the service work on most of this equipment. I mean, we, thank goodness, a lot of it's incredibly reliable. And we'll move into the, into the milk house where we've got two bulk tanks. And, you know, that's a 300-gallon and a 400-gallon tank. Well, that's unheard of in the dairy world nowadays. It used to be standard. So um, some of those are actually getting harder to find because there just aren't very many left. But uh, ironically, I wish everything in the world was as dependable as that old Sunset 300-gallon bulk tank that we have, which once we got it charged up, we have not touched it for 20 years. And it was a 1960s vintage machine at that point. So uh, I just can't say enough about it. It's, it's like I said, things aren't made like they used to be. <laughs> so this here is a high line uh, with a line above. And they call this a swing over parlor. So the actual claws move from one side to another. In, in relationship to uh, the style uh, of parlor that they have. They are very efficient from the standpoint of how much equipment and you can be moving uh, uh, in some of the larger operations, generally speaking, you can be moving animals in on one side and moving uh, animals out through the process. In your case, you just bring all 24 Correct. in. They milk, 
and then they all go out and you bring a new batch in. Yes. Um, the aspects of efficiency, um, they move milk out fairly rapidly. You use two people in the parlor? No, just me. Just you? <laughs> just me. You go like crazy then. That's right. Yes. Well, good. Uh, that's what keeps you young, right? Right. All right. right. Yes. Uh, two, um, two people can work here, although but there's not enough. Room. It's a little bit yeah. tight, and again, we were restricted by the size of the bar that had been building new things would be a little different, but this has worked well for us for, for 20 years. Uh, the, the decking itself is actually uh, old hog slat from, mm -hmm. uh, from nurseries, nursery slat, yeah. uh, fiberglass slats. We built, custom built the uh, the stand itself from, from scratch, basically, and then, like I say, we were able to locate the headlocks from a dairy that put milking over in Wisconsin, and uh, They've worked very, very well for us from that standpoint. And it is also a clean in place, which is really a labor saver rather than, you know, having to move all those claws inside the, the milk house to, to do that cleaning. But uh, again, a low line clean in place has been really, uh, I think, a, a very much of a benefit. So you may want to comment on the silicone claws and all of that too. And, and uh, you know, the longevity of that, the hoses. It's, uh, yeah, like I say, it's the Capra Twin by GEA, and very specific uh, style of uh, inflations that work with these claws. And, uh, they are silicone, and they do last a lot longer than the rubber products. But you do pay for that privilege. This would be the old Sunset 300 gallon tank that I picked up on a farm auction um, when we first got started with this. And everyone asked me, how did you get it in here? <laughs> There's a panel on the end that actually will take it right into the bar the other way. So it wasn't easy, but like most of those things, they uh, you find a way to get it through here. But there's the water heater over there for the floor heating um, in the parlor. Uh, the actual milk house stays plenty warm enough with the compressor from the uh, from the bulk tank here. Um, we never had any real issues with that, although we do have a backup electric heater as well for real cold times. But, and then the 400-gallon tank we picked up after we started shipping to uh, Mount Sterling, where we had more milk. And both of these tanks, when we were in peak production, will get full in a five-day pickup. Four days. Or four day, I'm sorry, four day pickup. So, uh, this is a 400 gallon zero. Um, they have a personality of their own, so I won't make any comment about that. But um, that compressor is actually located out in, in the vacuum pump room. But otherwise, as far as the rest of it goes, um, we have a automatic washer and the standard, you know, dairy equipment from the receiving jar and the milk pump and and uh, vacuum controller and pulsation system. And, um, one thing that's critically important for good bacteria is of course having a good source of hot water. And uh, that actually uh, is a commercial water heater that uh, is set at 160 degrees. So um, we commented earlier about our water here. We do have extremely hard water, so we do have a water softener uh, for the, the washing that makes a huge difference as anyone would would guess um, from a standpoint of chemicals working properly for sanitation and so forth so we are considered grade B um, from the standpoint of our milk going for cheese um, but interestingly enough when we started this project the first thing we did was contact our, our Minnesota dairy inspector and sat down with him across the kitchen table and asked him, what do we have to do to do this correctly so we don't have to do it again? And that was really a, a critical thing in the first step of putting together a, a, a grade A, grade B parlor. Uh, there really is no difference in grade A and grade B other than you get inspected twice with grade A. But, you know, the, the fiberglass wall, um, in the milk house, in the parlor, easy cleaning, 
you know, things of that nature and all that. And, and uh, but again, visiting with him up front, um, one, built the relationship. And uh, number two, hopefully then we, and we did, got everything right the first time and didn't have to redo, so. Um, and he, he wouldn't say that you should do this or that. He said, if I was going to do it, this is what I would do. Yes. Because when we got started with this, there was not, there were no resources available for us like that. So um, a lot of it has been trial and error. And that's you know, expensive. It can be. Yeah. Uh, it can oh, yeah. be very expensive. And uh, uh, I'm still waiting for the day when someone can come up with the perfect feeder for goats where they won't waste feed. But that's mm. the nature of the beast. You know, there are browsers, they're really not grazers, and they kind of like to to do that and uh, anyone who has goats know that they tend to want to pull things out and drop it on the ground and then once it's on the ground it's done <laughs> but it's the nature of the beast so um goat shows are a great place just to connect with other goat breeders and uh, kind of share ideas and see what's out there um, any goat looks great in the barn by itself you sometimes have to get them out there to uh really see how they do stack up against the uh, the other animals of their breed. It helps a bit with sales if you do well. The other thing that wasn't mentioned was that, that Sherry is also part of the linear appraisal program through the American Dairy Goat Association and annually the herd is appraised by a certified appraiser and that coupled with the DHI records and so forth is all about building that reputation as well as, as evaluation for stock sales and breeding stock. And getting the education to breed a better goat. So as we drove in, I saw uh, some really nice fencing and facilities outside that you have for, I'm assuming, raising um, kids and young stock, um, specifically even dry does perhaps uh, as well. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what type of fencing you utilize here and then maybe even go into a little bit more uh, detail on biosecurity specifically. The, the fencing we use in the main area for the pastures is all high tensile, um, electrified. Um, we actually use a solar charger on that. That's worked out extremely well. Um, that uh, that originally, I think everyone probably knows, kind of originated in New Zealand and now has become a mainstream in our, our neck of the woods. Um, barbed wire doesn't work for goats. That's not a good thing. Um, I would say that our fencing is more to keep other things out than necessary to keep the goats in. Uh, we're fortunate here, we, we, we don't have predatory animals um, that we've ever had any issues with. There are coyotes in the area, but we've not had any problems. Um, but uh, from the standpoint of maintenance, there is absolutely nothing better for low maintenance than a high tensile fence. Um, I've had full size trees come down from our grove on top of that fence and you cut the tree off and the fence comes back and you straighten up a couple posts and you're good to go. So uh, that's the main thing for a pasture area really works well. Are you using five strands? We're using five, five. with the three center electrified. The bottom one is a ground, the top one is a ground. So. And those grounds are hooked at ground rods throughout the course of the entire run uh, of fence or just? Just on the end of, of the beginning and the end. We're a pretty sh small area here, so we don't have to worry too much about multiple rods. But uh, again, we've been fortunate. We've never had any issues with lightning or anything like that. But the ground rods definitely help from the standpoint of the effectiveness of the fence. Um, like any electric fence, there's always the training scheme that goes through. but. We do divide our pastures and use uh, the electric twine for those dividers when we want to put young stock out on the pasture. Um, that's always a little more of a challenge when they are learning. But um, so from that standpoint, from our paddock areas, or you had another question? Yeah, I thought I saw a Parmac fence charger. Is correct. that correct? Okay. Yes. Yeah. And, and that has been good for you? Any problems with lightning or that sort of? None. Okay. 
No, nope, that's worked out great. We have the six volt unit because we, again, we don't have that money mile or money fence, uh, money fee offense, but um, that's worked out very well. Six joule? Uh, it's a six volt. Six volt. Six volt uh, okay. solar charger. So, okay. Yeah. I think they said it's good up to 25 miles of fence, so we are anywhere near that. So, um, From the standpoint of paddock fencing, um, like many, we have. Uh, utilize the standard cattle panel uh, for that. Um, not really the most ideal fencing for goats. Uh, it works, but they have a tendency to, uh, they can get stuck in it. Um, the bucks, if you it absolutely will, just don't want to use them for bucks if you have does across the fence because they'll literally destroy that trying to get to them but worse than that they'll stick their head through and they can't get it out and you end up cutting white it's just a nightmare so uh, if you're going to have bucks next to does uh, you, you really need to have some good heavy duty you know tubular type fencing that can withstand that activity what size holes do you recommend for goats? Do you know what the um, length and width are on those? Are they... um, it would be ideal if they couldn't stick their head through it all, which gets you down to a, basically a two by four pattern, which are very expensive panels. Um, these are the standard, and I don't know exactly what those cattle panels are. Um, Unfortunately, they're just big enough where two heads can get through and can't get back out. Uh, not so much a problem with the adults, but with the young kids. You'll get two or three stuck sometimes just because of goats are goats. And it's very frustrating. The gates we utilize um, are nothing special. We, we buy them at, at the farm store. Um, most of them that we purchase are called a pasture gate. Uh, which um, work fine for adults. However, certain brands uh, you need to watch because the spacing on the lower pipes are too wide and the young kids will jump through them. So uh, we've actually found um, a, a line of gates that has a seven, I believe it's a seven panel gate instead of a six. And that puts the spacing at the bottom of those narrower and our, our young kids when they're weaned will not jump through them and that's 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 real nice otherwise i've actually taken and attached a cattle panel to the gate to prevent that from happening but now with these it works quite well great investment yes and again we have adopted those gates and put a slam latch on all of them just for ease of operation in addition to a chain we use both when we're in our in our paddocks and our feeders just just because we don't want them getting out uh, when they're when they're in the outside. So, um, you 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 had suggested that you utilize uh, poly rope or poly uh, wire uh, for cross fencing and such. Uh, there's a lot of discussion uh, in relationship to electro net. I'd like to get your perspective if you tried that um, and had. Um, some suggestions, uh, pro or con, in relationship to that. We had tried Electronet way back uh, when it was first introduced. Um, I personally don't care for it. Uh, the main reason is um, if you can keep that from getting tangled, once you open it up and roll it back up again, you're a better man than I am. Um, if an animal does get through it, you've got a problem because they can't get out of it in many cases. And then uh, they use it for sheep a lot, I know, but sheep aren't as inquisitive as goats, I think, and it may work for that. But for goats, I've not been impressed at all with it. Um, and so I, yeah, we, we haven't used it. We just use two, two wires and temporary posts that we step in and you know, yeah, they're going to run through it once in a while, but once they get used to it, they do tend to stay stay where they need to be. So, uh, another thing that I uh, a 
observed out there is you utilize the uh, porta huts or huts uh, for housing in your in your uh, pasture system. Um, can you give me a little bit more uh, detail in regards to what brought you to that? Uh, and um, and now that you have them. Um, is maintenance pretty easy, and why do you have them elevated is another component that I... Great questions. Uh, start with, when you're getting started with a dairy, money isn't exactly flush, and uh, unless it's changed recently, most bankers aren't really willing to loan money for goat dairies, but that may have changed. Uh, we never were needing to do that, but the porta huts are a, a relatively inexpensive way uh, for animal housing. Um, originally, when we got started, that was our main stay of housing for the animals, the dairy, dairy uh, milkers and everything. And they were set basically on the ground as they came from a porta hut with the, uh, the skids under them. Again, when it comes to cleaning, um, you need a pretty small skid loader to be able to get in and out of those without doing damage and we actually had to take the fronts off of them to do that. Um, that required a fair amount of work to do. They don't just come off real easy. It's, we leave them off in the summer, we did, but at one point or another we transitioned when we built the new barn that we've seen. Uh, these we're still using for some milkers but mainly for dry stock and young stock and bucks. Um, and even with the small skid loader, it was still a challenge to clean without doing damage to those units. So the other issue that really drove us to elevating them on the big concrete blocks was the whole issue of environment within those huts. They get beastly warm and hot in the summer, even with the front wide open and the back doors open. They're only, uh, they're just not that tall. These are the 14 foot wide units. And by elevating them up on top of a three foot concrete block, it improved the ventilation and the environment within those huts a thousand percent. It just seemed to make the airflow work better. And if they did get stagnant air, it's above the animals and just a whole lot better. We have since also added a front door to them that basically is on a hinge that we lift with a, a winch and open during the summer when the weather is better. We keep that closed in the winter. And it takes me about 10 minutes to open those doors up and I chain them up and then I can go in and clean and I can run and along the side of those block with my skid loader and not have to worry about damage. We also have feeders inside that we use when weather is inclement um, to be able to feed them inside when the outside feeders don't, don't work very well. Um, th that was a, a tremendous improvement to put them up on the blocks. It, it wasn't an easy thing to do. It took a lot of time and effort, but um, we were able to, uh, it, it was a big improvement to make those huts a lot, a lot more user friendly for the animals and that way. So the goats stay nice, warm, and dry inside the hut, and he runs back and forth in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> um, the feeders that we have outside when we go out to look at those are all feeders that we built, that I built, um, and actually modified. Uh, originally, those feeders, they're 12 feet long um, and about three feet wide, feed from both sides. Um, and I guess I didn't mention this when we were in the other barn, but when we put 24 head out there, that means there's only one foot of space per head. That is not enough for mature does. We have 16 inches of feeder space in the big barn where we have our 24 head. And that actually is plenty. So it isn't a lot, but that four inches makes a huge difference. And these feeders work very well for the young stock and, and things. And we can adjust the space on them by just moving a board up or down. But um, I have found that about eight to 10 inches is adequate for the, the head 
spacing for the, the mature does. Bucks, you need the full 10 inches. The young stock, to keep them from climbing in the feeders, when they're first put out, we're down to five and a half inches and bump that to seven inches after they get a little bigger. Um, this is the spacing where they stick their head through. So, um, and they're covered. They work well for, for the most part. When the wind is blowing hard and it's really inclement, then we do feed inside. But otherwise, uh, they, they work well. There's a door on each side so I can clean them out easily and, and, and shuffle them out. We do use the shavings around those feeders when we scrape the yards, probably once a week or more often if it needs it. And we throw shavings down, again, just to help with that clean out process and provide them a little bit of dryness when they're standing there and, and eating. So, and those outside pens also have the Nelson waters in them and they all have free water available all the time. Um, and I did mention earlier that when it gets 20 below and the wind is blowing, we'll get a little ice rain on them, but for the most part have not had any major issues with them at all. So, so we very much manage those outside lots like most people manage their inside pens keeping them scraped and bedded. So another thing that a lot of um, folks struggle with, uh, your situation is slightly different because you're in some cases on dry lot, but when they are out on pasture, do you struggle with um, different uh, internal parasites specifically? And uh, do you specifically uh, have a, a plan developed in relationship to addressing your internal parasites? Yes, we uh, pasture the bucks through the summer months and I do use copper boluses before I turn them out as well as a good worming before they go out onto the clean ground. And then those pastures sit empty over winter. And uh, I think that helps the most winters to kind of clear those out. And do you rotate products that you're utilizing or do you pretty much stick with um, uh, one particular type or uh, style of deworming material? We have not seen um, any resistant worms at this stage. So the ivermectin for our mature animals, um, not milkers of course, but for the box has worked well. Because uh, tapeworm can be an issue in the young stock, we tend to use Velbazin just because that will also get those tapeworms. I think what a lot of people think is parasite resistance is they're just reinfecting themselves that fast because they have such a buildup of parasites in that animal's environment. Our kid nursery has a cement floor. Most of our other locations are a dirt floor, which we prefer it that way. But the kid nursery gets pressure washed before every batch of kids because I, I just don't think you can overemphasize putting newborns in a clean environment. When the water on this farm goes through this barn. Start out in a warm room for a few days till they get, uh, get their colostrum and then they get used to the lamb bar and then they get moved out here in groups of 13 and uh, until we need the space they stay here and then they move into a, another building and, and uh, that's where they get weaned generally and from there they go off to the bigger pens. So how do you deliver the milk to uh, groups of 13? Do you have a dairy bar or? I have a lamb bar, lamb which bar? is the five gallon pail with 13 nipples and straws going down to the bottom. And then that's what the chain's hanging in each pen is I can just reach the bucket over and uh, hang it. I guess we didn't mention earlier, but uh, all the kids get pasteurized goat milk. We have not gone down the road of using milk replacer. Uh, yeah, we have a 30-gallon uh, dairy tech pasteurizer that we use to, to pasteurize. For large groups, and then we also pasteurize milk on the stove if we're not to the minimum level for the using the pasteurizer. We can treat colostrum um, using a Fujita cooker, which uh, 
has worked extremely well for us. It just kind of heats and circulates the water in a water bath, and then we can do anywhere from a quart to a gallon of colostrum in a batch. So with that in mind, then, you really don't ever freeze colostrum as such? We do freeze do extra you? colostrum because we don't like to keep it more than three or four days at refrigerated temperature. So when we have a lot of does coming in at one time, it's all freshly pasteurized uh, colostrum. Otherwise, it's frozen. We've been freezing in a little eight-ounce bottle that thaws quickly. And how many feedings of uh, that do you give the, the kids? We like to keep them on the colostrum for 24 hours. So depending what time of day they're born, will determine whether you know, it's three or four feedings. Uh, do you put down any um, uh, lime? Yes. Okay. We do use barn lime, then a layer of shavings and straw on top of that. Um, we've got the turbine vents on uh, this barn, and we've put slides on them so we can open or close them as the weather dictates. Uh, in the summer, I completely take the windows out and have as much ventilation as possible in here. So with that in mind, you talked about the sanitation process in here of power washing. Yes. Um, using a sanitizer in addition or just hot water? Just hot, pretty much hot water. Hot water. Yeah. And then you use the lime as an additional layer of uh, sanitation. In Primarily acid. we're looking to neutralize the uh, ammonia with the, uh, the barn lime. If we have health issues in past years, one year we had done a 4-H tour and got um, sore mouth in the herd. That year we did sanitize everything and then I repainted. And that uh, seemed to eliminate future problems with that. This barn gets cleaned every five days. When they're on milk, they're producing a lot of uh, moisture. And it's all handwork. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the yeah. big disadvantage of this farm <laughs> is that it is all handwork. Mm -hmm. That's another thing, doing it every five days, it's a doable job and uh, not letting it get too bad. Do you always use pelleted grain in uh, the kids? Yes. Just to increase intakes and or consistently? I eliminate consist picking. Yeah. Consistency of intake. Yeah. Yeah. We had started with a, a local grind mix, and we always had problems with vines. You know, it's like one batch they would get right, the next one they think they were making pig feed. And... What I had was, how do we deliver the hay into those bunks? Uh, uh, do you use a TMR mixer, or uh, uh, what, what process do you use? You're looking at oh, Armstrong. <laughs> Armstrong. Armstrong. We, uh, this is our commodity shed. Um, we buy the, the large square bales of hay and basically flake them off into the back of the bone and deliver them to the feeders manually. So it's, it's highly labor intensive. There's no question about that. I, actually, this doesn't look like a really complicated building. It was the first one that we built here. Or hay storage. But I kind of got the idea from uh, the Rosemount uh, farm that they had at the university where they were storing these big bales. This is probably 15, 20 years ago. And so the bays are 16 feet wide, so we basically can run 45 bales in each uh, section, so 90 bales per bay. And uh, we just about get our entire year's supply of hay uh, in, this, in this barn when it's, when it's ready. Uh, which is back to what we talked about earlier being important when you, you can find the right quality and crop, you can get it all in at one time. We do have storage for grass down there, our shavings are at the end, and then we have a spade for straw that we have as well. Uh, another thing to uh, look at and point out is that they use a, um, a sheet of plastic on the ground to minimize the, the wicking of moisture up from the ground and also to catch uh, leaf loss as they are uh, moving back into the, the dakota. Uh, they also 
use a series of pallets to put underneath there to create that uh, air space so that they don't have um, um, mold or anything um, developing on the bottom side if it was in direct contact with that plastic. So that's another really critical component. And then there's still adequate head space so that if there is moisture, they leave a, a space in between the bales instead of packing them tight so that the moisture can uh, actually uh, um, dissipate out of the bale uh, in that scenario. Could you describe how you use the rack system? Uh, so do you place the bales onto the rack so that when you cut the bales that the ends of the bales don't fall off? Could you describe how you you go through that process? Yeah, the uh, we move the hay down with the, uh, I've got a wheel loader, but a big skid loader will do it as well. These bales weigh about 950 pounds. And I built the bulkhead on the end, so the end that I'm not feeding from, when I cut the strings, that it doesn't fall off and go all over the ground. So uh, the first cut, I do have to have the, the Kubota backed up tight, because a lot of that hay will fall out when I cut the strings. Depends on the hay. This particular bales right now are quite dry. They tend to fall apart. Uh, the proper moisture, they'll hold together and it works very well. Another main point I want to make, and you can just shine the camera to the ceiling. We insulated all the roofs of these buildings to keep the condensation drift down. And limiting, basically. If you've ever been in a, in a steel building with no insulation during the change of seasons, these buildings will literally rain moisture. So, um, I think the product is called PSK, but it's basically a one inch insulation blanket that they put down on the rafters before they put the steel on. Um, in the new barn that we should have the animals in, there was a product developed called Ripstop, and that is actually a sheeting of steel with a felt backing, and that also acts as a moisture barrier so that it doesn't drip and rain during the change of seasons with temperature. And that is absolutely critical for any steel type roofing that you, uh, building that you put up, especially for animals or, or hay or commodities. As far as our manure storage go, I mentioned that we do the clean out of the different yards and the pens. And during the summer, when we can't spread out in the fields around, we, we stockpile in a storage area. You'll see that later when she goes out and takes that picture. But we basically have put down a, a crushed limestone base, and then we use the big blocks to build the walls around that so that we contain all of that material. And then, uh, again, spread it in the fall after the crop is harvested uh, when the conditions are right for that. So uh, that's worked out quite well for us. Components that we are very interested in addressing is what are some of the keys to the success of your uh, dairy goat operation? Quality genetics, I think, is one. If you don't have the potential to produce large volumes of the milk, it's just not going to cash flow. I would say facility wise and equipment wise, you. you you have to have the proper facility and the proper equipment to do the work that you want to get done. Or you can't be efficient and, and end up with a good good product in the end. So, you know, your milking system is key. And then having equipment to be able to, you know, move your feed, move your manure, uh, you know, do those types of things. Facility-wise, you know, having, a, it just seems like with goats, you just have to have a lot of flexibility with your pens and things to be able to move animals at different ages and have the facilities to be able to, you know, hold them at different stages of life and have enough room for, for all of them to, you know, be able to 
thrive in, in whatever situation they're in. I think you have to love the animals and be willing to work hard. <laughs> Good. I think that's one of the greatest challenges animal agriculture is facing is it's kind of, you know, I'm certainly no expert, but I think when we look at what's happened in, in especially the, the dairy cattle industry, where we're basically going from, you know, your 100 cow dairies to the mega large, large, large dairies that's been driven by um, probably some economics, but um, this is hard work. Dairy is hard work. Takes a commitment. It's twenty four seven, and in a small operation, you can't afford to hire a lot of people to do a lot of that work. So, you've got to be committed to it one hundred and twenty percent. It's not that small dairies can't be economically successful. It's just that for most people, there's easier ways of making a living. What about the aspects of your marketing? Do, do you feel as if that uh, plays into some of your success, both the marketing of your milk production, but also the marketing of your your um, your offspring breeding stock? That is an area that I feel I could do a lot better on is marketing our genetics. Um, when I look at some of our animals that have gone to other herds, have done well on the show nationally and look at you know them comparing to um, animals that came from other herds they stand up very well and I feel like I just need to do a better job getting pictures of them and getting it out there so people can see what we have. What I can say is you have one chance to start out with healthy animals and I can't overemphasize how important that is once you've brought diseases into your farm, some of those will be there practically forever because you just can't clean it up and get rid of it. So pay a little extra to get healthy animals. Don't take anyone's word for it. Have them tested for the diseases that you're concerned about and just yeah, start out healthy and it will pay unbelievably well in the long term. Um, if people are expanding from a small herd into a larger one, look at the whole picture. Um, if you're expanding the number of milkers, realize you're going to have that many more kids to take care of and expand the nursery at the same time or you're going to run into problems. Nothing will give you unhealthy animals faster than overcrowding. Uh can you tell us a little bit about the relationship that you have with your milk processor, how you've developed that, and um, is that important for the long-term success of your operation? Having a market for your milk is everything. Um, processors are limited how many miles they can travel, so you can't just set up a dairy anywhere and expect that you're going to be able to sell your milk. You need to make those connections before you start square one and just make sure that you're in an area where you have a processor that will um, take on that milk. Um, I think unlike the cow industry, goat, uh, goat processors are more careful not to overbuy milk. They want to make sure that their sales justify the number of producers that they have that they're allowing those producers to expand at the level that they want before they take on new producers. So it's not unusual to see a wait list for um, people that want to begin to start shipping milk um, that uh, they would have to wait until someone leaves or sales demand that uh, they would uh, be looking for more milk. Under normal sort of situations with normal milk production per dough, what do you think is kind of a, a minimum number of doughs that you would have to start with to justify bringing in a commercial uh, milk processor to purchase your milk? I think that they put more emphasis on number of head than I personally do. I'm looking more at pounds of milk. But as we expanded our herd, I didn't feel like we were really profitable until we hit about 100 head. You had so many set costs as far as, you know, 
stop fees for the truck, the chemicals for cleaning, um, your you know, milking equipment, that it took about a hundred head to really make that tipping point to be a profitable dairy. Uh, equally as important uh, is having a good relationship with the suppliers that you need to make your dairy successful. Having those people that you can rely on for good quality hay, whether that's the neighbor or broker or whoever. Um, having a good, reliable feed provider, you know, pellet, uh, protein, whatever uh, you decide you choose that way. Simple things that, that you may not think of but are critically important. Um, having a, an electrician that you can call <laughs> when you have a problem. Um, we talked earlier about, you know, being able to have a reliable dairy uh, equipment repair available, refrigeration, milk line, if you're not able to do those things yourselves. Um, you know, those are, those are all critical factors that when you're in the middle of milking and something happens, you need to have people that you can rely on that can come out and help get you through that. It gets you through those challenges if you're not able to do that yourself. So... Um, it, it's there's a lot of there's a lot of things that need to be in line and, and, and be uh, be organized to be a successful farm. And, and a dairy is, is is really critical because it, it is time critical. So, um, and I, I I've always said it's it's all about balance. Um, when we talk about overcrowding and the problems that has. Uh, if you haven't got the support equipment that you need to support the number of animals you have, whether that's just the storage for feed or being able to clean the, the, the barns properly and things of that nature, um, you know, it's going to hamper the operation. So all of those things play into the, the success of the dairy and, and it's critical to, to have a handle on before you make the big jump into a commercialized operation. Okay, that was the end of the video. Um, so as I said before, if you had troubles viewing it, um, maybe the audio wasn't quite the volume you wish it would have been, um, we are going to be sending out that link later so you can rewatch those portions. Um, we would like to also thank Sherry and Rob for allowing us the time to go out there. Okay. And so, um, I just want to say what a great presentation. It was very thorough. You answered a lot of questions before we even had to ask them, which is great. Um, I got to get to the right questions here. Um, there is a question with those long lactations, how long a dry period do they allow? The same as the uh, does that are bred every year, 50 to 60 day dry period. Okay. Sherry, as a follow up to that, what sort of um, uh, decreased or what percentage of a loss of production do you have with those uh, does that are in their second or third um, uh, year um, compared to uh, their first uh, year? Uh, of the lactation? I don't know that I have an exact number on it. Um, what we find is that uh, they tend to drop production some when the days are shorter in the winter and then in the spring the production will come back up. The winter milk tends to have higher components so it's a little harder to make a fair comparison if you take all of that into account. That's also a very, um, uh, call it a genetically related thing. Not all of the animals will, will do that. Um, Sherry's been able to kind of identify those that will do an extended lactation and maintain decent production, but it's not, certainly not all lines will do that. The other thing for the audience, it's really critical to realize that the quality of your forage and the mixture or combination of the alfalfa and the grass was 
superior quality and therefore that will help them maintain that uh, uh, lactation curve much, much better than if they had um, uh, poor off spec sort of uh, hay as well. So um, that's, that's great that you pay such close attention to that but it's also important that other people realize that that is one of your management uh, uh, techniques that not everybody is, is so uh, keen or uh, in tune to. I see one of the questions that just popped up was asking if we tested our forage and yes, we do. Um, we actually require that they do a complete test uh, we use dairy lend labs, or I, I specifically want that uh, test here in Minnesota from Dairyland. And then we give that to our feed folks, and then they take a look at that and take a look at the pellet we have mixed and and make sure that we're on track with, with the right, right balance in, in that and so forth. But yes, we do test all of our forage. It's kind of that double-edged sword where you know, I talked about the trouble of getting good quality forage. Well, when you're buying your hay, which we do, that gives you that opportunity, but also responsibility to find good quality hay and, and hold the person you're buying it from accountable. If you raise your own hay, unfortunately, you feel as though you're compelled to have to use that hay and it may or may not be the quality that you, you really want, but are you know, because of cost, you, you know, you go ahead and use it. And of course, production will reflect that as well. So Travis kind of alluded to this and um, how have you developed a relationship with your veterinarian? I, I don't think you can overemphasize that relationship. I've had opportunity to work with a number of really good quality veterinarians over the year that have taught me so much. And uh, yeah. It's, it's one of those, and I'm sure you're all acutely aware of it. And certainly anyone who is raising large animal knows um, <laughs> large animal veterinarians are becoming more and more scarce. Um, it's, we're fortunate we have a Wasika vet clinic, you know, up the road 15 miles and um, they have a, an excellent large animal vet. And he spends a lot of time on the road because they're just, the folks are retiring and they're not, there aren't people going into large animal practice. And it, it, it I, I, I think it, it, I don't know if we can call it a crisis yet, but it, it can get, it can get there in a real hurry. Um, if, if some more folks don't get, get trained up to be large animal vets, so that's for sure. We have a couple more minutes here for a few more questions. So if anyone has any burning questions, um, we have a few more minutes for questions. A question I never had a chance to uh, ask and I, uh, I think it's really critical. Do you get premiums for your, the quality of your milk? Uh, you know, somatic cell, fat content, protein content, or how is that pricing structure uh, um, developed? All of the above, yes. We get premiums for low bacteria, and then uh, the base price for a certain level of butter, fat, and protein, and your checks are plus or minus, depending where you fall in that category. And just to, you might have answered this already, but what do you think is the best investment you've made in your dairy goat operation? I think the herd sires, because a buck can do so much more to improve your herd than a doe can. Just bringing in doe bucks from you know high producing does with a good longevity, and that will just keep adding to your herd as the years go on. Okay, well, in the essence of time, um, 
Oh, there's one more question real quick. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, do you have any strategies for marketing buck kids produced in the operation? We um, raise our bucks that we don't feel our buck quality to go into a medical lab for antigen production. So we, we try to, we do raise all of our kids and do look for, you know, the best marketing options for them. We also have a local meat market that uh, will buy started kids if I have something that I don't feel is even quality to go into a lab. Being a small herd, I feel it's really important that each kid is raised and marketed at the, the best opportunity. And as Sherry mentioned earlier in the presentation that a significant portion of our income does come from the sale of breeding stock. And that's primarily from the same standpoint of the, the sires. And so again, DHI testing, linear appraisal, um, all of that uh, helps to, I, number one, identify the quality dams. And then of course, those bucks that uh, can be marketed as herd sires to go on and improve you know, other herds um, in, in the industry. Very good. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sherry and Rob, for allowing us again to do this dairy tour and for sticking around for the questions and answers. Uh, thank you to the U of M small ruminant team also for putting this presentation together. And also thank you all um, for attending this webinar tonight. I hope it was helpful for you and that you enjoyed the presentation.